Welcome back to Franchise Canada Chats. Whether you're already part of the franchise community or thinking about buying a franchise, welcome to today's episode. Gary Prenovo here. I'm the author of the award-winning book, The Unstoppable Franchisee, and president of Frannet of Southern Ontario, a franchise search firm. Today's guest is Jason O'Connor, a regional franchisee with JDI Cleaning. He currently owns and operates two territories, one in the Hamilton Burlington area and one in Niagara. He came to franchising from the world of real estate with a specific focus on working with investors. We're very, we're very excited to hear Jason's views today. So Jason, welcome to today's episode of Franchise Canada Chats. Thanks for having me, Gary. It's our pleasure. So let's let's maybe start with, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to JDI and became a JDI master franchisee? Yeah. So as you mentioned, uh, started with real estate. So that was kind of the early entry for business for me. Uh, I was 21 when I was first introduced to real estate investing. From there, I just naturally started working with um, investors as I got my license. I got my license when I was um, 22, 23. So over the years, you know, building up a, a bit of a, an investment portfolio and also um, involved in the sales side, just naturally started to look at different opportunities. Real estate market is very interesting. Obviously, right now we're looking at a bit of a down market. So it, it it's kind of easy for a real estate investor to start looking into other directions. So I started looking into businesses, uh, specifically franchises. I looked at some in the uh, fitness space, uh, animal space, and um, ended up uh, finding JDI. And that was uh, the best decision I've made so far. Yeah, that, that that's great to hear. How long how long ago did you become a franchisee? It's been about a year, year and a half, a little over a year and a half. So November 2022 was my okay. first month with JDI. Okay. And and um I, I see that you were um not only a real estate investor, but you're a junior hockey player as well. That's that's pretty cool. So a lot of discipline uh, from the sports field, team spirit, all all of that. As a franchisee, how have you been able to benefit from the skills that you've gained from those the real estate career as well as the experience on in hockey? Uh, I would say when I look at sports and when I learn from sports, obviously the years that it takes to become good at something is is the first thing. So longevity, really trying to build um, a long term presence in the field. So business is very similar. Obviously, there's companies that of quick success, but for most people, for most businesses, it does take a while. And uh, so discipline through sport. I always make the reference that when you're playing, I've played hockey. So if you're playing hockey, you, you know, you, you've got to get up and go for a run. You've got to do your uh, mobility just to keep yourself healthy, keep yourself in the game as long as you can. And nobody's waking you up in the morning and saying, hey, you got to go for a, a run you got to stay in shape off season, nobody's making you go work out. So there's obviously things that you're going to have to internally motivate yourself to do. And that's no different in business. And I found a lot of parallels with that. And I find in, in, in my previous or still my current career, but the, the previous business with real estate, a lot of athletes would get into that space. And I find uh, that they would find success in that because they've learned the skill of discipline. There's so many things that you can do sports and even crossovers between different businesses where the skills are transferable and discipline is, is definitely the biggest one that uh, applies to business from sport. Well, I can't agree more. In, in, in my book, I talk about the, the shift and the progress from in learning. Uh, so to go from somebody who's an average performer, they, they have to, practice and those disciplines that you're talking about, they move from competence to proficiency. Now they become a good performer, but in, in sports, good isn't good enough. It's like, yeah. they're not even making the double a hockey, right? Yeah. So you have to move from proficiency to mastery and really become excellent at your craft. Uh, and and I, I see like you, I see the same in that in business. So the discipline to constantly pick on a few key skills, develop, hone and enhance those when you when you look to the JDI business as you launched and started growing, what were the most important areas of focus that you really had to double down on and get to know Jason? With the model with JDI, I inherited um, 
21 franchisees, so local franchisees. And the first thing that I wanted to do was meet with all of them, see what they liked, what they didn't like, how they operated, how I was you know, going to interact with them on a daily basis. That was the first thing that I wanted to, to really complete before doing anything, you know? And then secondly, it was just trying to move as fast as possible and use speed to my advantage. So if a, if a you know call comes in or, or an inquiry comes in with the lead, as fast as possible, I want to get on the phone with them. I want to book the, the, the quote as fast as possible and I want to send it to them as fast as possible. So just moving with intent. And that was the same thing with sport. It's it's a, another crossover skill. You know, speed is, is can be grow fast growth can be tricky at times. But with the older economy businesses, I think in that service field, if you're fast and you're quick um, with customers, with with responsiveness, I think that's a huge bonus. So that was a big thing that I wanted to focus on. But more than anything was getting the franchisees on board for um, for my style. And I wanted to learn more about them and, and how they like to be dealt with. So I'm, I'm hearing a few key things. Get to know your people. What's important to them is not just meet them. It's who are you and what what's yeah. important to you the so for our listeners who are thinking about franchise ownership you want to be thinking about the type of employees you want and how important it is to um, understand how their goals are going to be met through being part of your organization um, i when i'm talking um, and doing keynote speeches i talk about your employee is your most Im important repeat customer with with the jdi model it's a little different their franchisees are doing the 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 fulfillment but it's still, you took the time, Jason, to do that. So really, really good on you to hear that. The other thing I, I hear is what we in the industry call speed to lead. The We are dealing with the most educated consumer in human history. And if they're not being responded to fast enough, they are going to go somewhere else because they know where next to go. So that speed to response and then quality of response are two of the things that I'm, I'm hearing you, you're doing well. Yeah, that's it's it's really interesting when you look at it from a consumer standpoint. And I've had this before and I've witnessed it with people when they call customer service. At the 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 important thing with customer service is you need to make that customer feel like it's it's only them that you're working with. I mean, obviously there's tons of things that we deal with on a daily basis, but you have to carve out time for the customer. They're the one who's paying you, they're the one who's keeping your business afloat. That's your revenue driver. And word of mouth. So if you do a really good job with that customer and you're quick, you're responsive, I think that's, uh, it just pays dividends over the long run. Especially again, I'll say it again, in these service-based businesses that have been around for many, many years, it's really hard to differentiate on the actual core business itself. So I think if we can really stand out, it's on our quality, obviously our quality of cleans are, are uh, you know, some of the best in the industry. But I would say that the customer service that we provide, like you said, the speed to lead, that's where we really um, set ourselves apart. I see that, Jason, you also participate in JDI's trade shows. With the information tools or other things there, is that part of the business generation or what, what are the different elements when you look at that? So trade shows, I mean, our goal with those is to build uh, regional growth. Um, among many things. I mean, brand awareness is a big thing for us and obviously being um, really intertwined with with the CFA, it's uh, it's, it's a big thing. So the trade shows, yeah, we go out there and we're, we're talking about our, our uh, structure, our model, the business. And I think anytime you're doing that to a, a large group of people, then uh, it's it's a positive. So for us, you know, we, we talk to hundreds of people over the course of those of those weekends and you know, as obviously, and JDI was was acquired by Trustpoint uh, about two and a half years ago. So with that comes just a lot of growth that we're growing, uh, growing, going through. So obviously, Anita Elliott coming in as as president, she's done a fantastic job of of scaling up, and um, those trade shows are just a, a piece of that. So the trade shows that you're doing is to recruit franchisees, then um, as well as the, to do that brand awareness that you're talking about. So yeah. let's, let's, for a couple of minutes, let's look at it from the other perspective, from the audience perspective, who's going to the trade shows or looking at other 
other paths to find their right franchise. Um, what do you recommend for them to consider information tools or anything like that? I would say um, what I did was start online. Obviously you get a wide, any, any franchise you're going to find online. Um, the database is so widespread. So start online, try and figure out the industry um, sector and the trade shows are more, if we're fully engaging with these people when they, when they walk by the booth, we're not just, you know, how is it going? We're trying to pull them in. We're trying to talk about the business. And if it's something that they're interested in, then those are the best uh, best conversations. You have somebody like myself who's who's in the regional shoes, and that's what they would be buying at the trade shows. Uh, I can also explain the local process. Anita, our president, and it's rare for presidents to be at the trade shows, and she's always in there, and she loves selling, and she's a fantastic salesperson. So for for her to be there, it's it's big for the brand as well. People come in, and they can talk directly to to her. So we. We go in there with the intention of bringing in as many, uh, as much interest as we can. So that's that's basically the goal. By the end of the weekend, we want to have a, have generated a, a bunch of interest for the brand. Okay. The guidance that we suggest clients follow is before going online, taking a look at themselves. What are their skills? What are their strengths? What are their passions for the types of work? Um, they, uh, we maintain they have to have conviction for the value proposition, whatever it might be, product or service. Yep. As a business owner, they have to love enough of the work it takes to put that biz that product or service in the consumer's hands, whether it's a, and also what type of customer you want. Is it a business to business customer or a business to consumer customer? These are all considerations yep. that when they go online, they can quickly qualify the areas that are better suitable um, so, okay, so after, after when with your own journey, after you went online and you started to get this basket of opportunities, how did we start narrowing it down? What what advice would you give to our readers or our listeners? Oh, man, that? that's tricky. I, it's funny because <clears throat> when I was presented with the opportunity for JDI, the, my first thought was commercial cleaning. Is that, you know, I, I was kind of hesitant to, to, to look into it. Once I looked into it, I was blown away by the actual model. I was blown away by the business, obviously the numbers. And I never thought of it. I never went into looking for a business and saying, I want to buy a commercial cleaning business. Looking back at it, like I said in the beginning, it was the best decision I've made because the old economy businesses that have been run by, you know, there's an older generation that's that's created these businesses and run them successfully for many years. Now, there's people like myself, I'm 28 coming into the industry and, um, you know, obviously learning from, from the older generation on industry secrets, but also bringing in uh, value through my entire life is technology. So technological integration, and that's what JDI has been doing. And the integrations with the things that they've done over the past 12 to 18 months are crazy. Um, so a lot of movement there. But from my perspective, it was to get into a business where I could see strong numbers, uh, strong strong people. I wanted something existing. I didn't want to buy something brand new. And also seeing where it could go. So I was aware of all the integrations that they were going to make into the business. And I just saw a lot of upside to that. So it was an easy decision after I had a chat with them and Anita, uh, uh, Jonathan Draycott and Adam Yashevsky, the uh, partners with Trustpoint, had a conversation with them, went through everything. And it was a, it was a no brainer for, for me. But for me to give that advice to somebody, I would say um, be in the right place at the right time. <laughs> but also, I think, go ahead. No, you continue. Oh yeah, I was, I was just gonna say. I think that the there is value in the in the um, the, the service industry, just with those businesses that have, that have been around for for a long time. So I think for people that are looking, I mean, you said it. You've got to like the industry that you're in. You've got to be willing to. Um, go in and have conviction. You can't just think things are gonna happen. You have to enjoy the work. There's a lot of things that everybody does on a daily basis in business that they don't love to do, but they're necessary in order to, to move the needle. So I think the, the the service business for me, it's easier to say now, but looking looking forward and, and future opportunities, that's where I would be looking. I love to hear that part of your journey that when you first saw it, it's like, what? Commercial yeah. cleaning. The, <laughs> we've worked with over two thousand people in our in our twenty plus year history, um, and 
90% of them have said, I would have never picked it from a list and I would have never seen myself in the business. Because what what when people start, they they have this perception of franchising as food and retail. Uh, yep. And they don't, they don't, they aren't aware of all the different options that are out there. So when we want the, the advice I gave earlier on about building that model, what are your skills? What are your goals? What are your criteria? A lot of people haven't done that. So we help them do that, then introduce options and then coach them through the research. So using a real estate analogy, uh, because <laughs> in your world, when people, um, they can look at all the different listings online, they say, ooh, ah, and then they go into the house and it's like, this doesn't look like the pictures did. Um, yeah. I don't order and as you get deeper and deeper, oh, I like this more. This becomes more important. And I don't like these features. And they really narrow it down. And that's a lot of what the franchise search looks like. So the other piece of advice we we have is look at multiple options at the same time. You said you identified several options as well, didn't you? Yeah, that's correct. And I think uh, you, you said it again. It's, it's in the word. It's the franchise search. You're searching. You're not instantly just attacking one brand and saying, that's what I want to do, unless you're introduced by somebody else, maybe a, a, a referral of some sort. But for most people, it's going to start widespread and you're going to, you're going to look at different industries. And if your current skill set works in those industries or for, for me, I felt sales ability, management skills that would have trans transferred very well to JDI. And so far it has, but I think that's really where you have to get honest with yourself and say, well, what am I good at? What am I really bad at? Can I hire that out? Is there enough money in this business or enough money that can be generated from this business for me to hire that aspect of the business? So focus on the strengths, look at something that's going to complement your skill set. And all of that, and for the gaps, um, does the franchisor offer systems, coaching, tools, process to help me bridge those gaps to learn to get to proficiency yep. or to, as you just said, hire somebody else out if it's something that, um, I don't like to do or don't want to do. And this yeah. is the other thing that you said a few minutes ago, I want to call out, Jason, because this is really important. Not every business, like all of the skills that are required, not everything you're doing is you're going to like. There's every business yeah. has work. Um, the And some of the stuff, it's that discipline we talked about earlier on today in professional sports. You learn that discipline and you apply the discipline. So it's... Uh, Anybody who's thinking about business, just because you buy a franchise, folks, it doesn't mean it's easy. It's easier because the systems and process, the path to follow and the support you have, but be prepared to work the hardest you ever have for the first couple of years to get that business off the ground and really, really going. Um, Jason, um, how do you see your future with JDI? Let's talk a little bit about your, your vision and where you see taking this business. So, I mean, I've mapped it out number wise. Um, I, I think for me, it's looking at the franchise base, of course, from the ground up, I'd like all the franchisees to be happy and, and I wanna be a part of their journey as well as they're building, they buy a JDI franchise with us to create something, whether it's a nest egg, whether they're looking to put their kids through school, just have a side income. So focusing on them first, if, I think if we focus on them and we build them up to where they want to be, everything will take care of itself. Um, but in terms of my my business, I guess, you know, obviously looking at the numbers, we'd like to to continue on a really strong growth uh, path tra trajectory. And we do have targets that, that we'd like to hit. So I think with me being a multi-unit owner, maybe that looks like um, potentially more units in the future or... Uh, just, you know, scaling the current ones. But um, I think with with JDI, there's a lot of growth opportunity within the, the business. And just generally speaking, within the cleaning industry, I think there's a lot of growth opportunity as well. What I love about the cleaning industry, you add customers, you add talent. So your internal talent, as you get more customers, you get more franchisees. And the the then you add, you could add sales team. So you can scale your business that way as well. Um, that was originally the goal for me was to acquire the franchises, run them. And that's the third year mark. I, I wanted to hire somebody in to handle some of the day-to-day, -day, some of the sales. And we ended up doing that. So we're a year and a half in, we brought in somebody, uh, Joe Calhau, he's incredible. I think when he started in, in the industry, I was six years old. So there you go. That's That talks about his uh, experience in, in commercial cleaning. And and that was a game changer for, for this business. It allows task to be delegated. And you said it before in the beginning of the business, you're wearing all the hats. So that's 
it, it does take a while. It, it's a lot of work that you didn't expect to do. When you hear about a business or when you look at a business, you oftentimes talk to people that have had a lot of success with it. And sometimes, you know, those people will say, oh, yeah, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. But until you actually do the work, it's it, it's all theory. And once you go through the process, you learn a lot about yourself. You gain a lot of experience in the industry. And uh, and then you're able to kind of make things happen. So I basically, you know, we put in the work and and now we're we're scaling. So it's it's a, it's a positive. The only place success comes before work is in the dictionary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> our, our, our technologically savvy kids these days, they say, what's a dictionary? I'm just going to Google it. <laughs> Wikipedia or whatever else. Yeah. The, any aha moments from the from the along your journey? What what were the big ahas that um, you can shed some light on that were surprises for you, whether good or challenging for our listeners to be better prepared for this this path if they want to consider it? That's a tricky one. The aha moment that I had would probably be, I mean, it could be, I could use the recent example of bringing on somebody um, taking over some of the sales and some of the some of the day-to-day. -day. But I guess I can go back in the beginning. I think what was a big realization for me was I spoke about the long game and you learn that in sport. But when you go from sport to being at the peak of where you can be at that at that moment in time, anything off of that peak is a movement in the downward direction. So when I go from hockey to real estate and real estate, you start at the bottom, you build it up, whether it's investing or sales, any industry, you start at the bottom, you build it up. So then going from there, so I had reached a, a, a height that I was proud of with, with hockey. You go to real estate, reach the height where I was proud of with, with, with that. And then just going to the bottom of the barrel again for, for this industry. So the aha moment was the, the realization that you need to stay in the business. It's not about working 100% effort for one year. Somebody that works 75% effort over the course of 10 years will, will crush anybody that's working 100% of the, of the work for a short period of time. So the, lo the long game is really the realization. And I think that took a lot for me in the beginning to understand that you know I need to really focus on not not uh, not just tomorrow or this month. I need to really map out a 10 year vision for this business. And where where am I going to start making moves through that 10 years? What targets am I going to hit? And what are we going to start to um, to do in the scaling process, whether that's people or uh, different systems, processes, whatever that looks like in, in your business. But it was buckle up. It's not going to be a short term play. This is something that we're going to stick to for a long time. And once you figure that out and once you feel comfortable in that position, everything kind of uh, rolls from there and takes care of itself. You, you, you give me goosebumps as I hear that that awareness because you've just touched on part of my journey and my story. Um, the I tell clients buying a franchise is a five to 10 year strategy, five years at the minimum. If they're considering changing jobs, that's a one to three year strategy in today's job market. But what I was good at, I've been in business for 35 years. I was a launch and build guy. I wouldn't in, in, invent something, but I would take an early adopter, launch it, get it up and onto that plateau that you're talking about. Yeah. What would I do next? Squirrel. <laughs> exactly, I, I would yeah. be completely distracted and go into something else. And I did that several times. And one of the businesses that I did, I had friend at running in the background. I was a top performer with friend at, and so I built my team and, and kept that running. And I would I went into something else and failed at it and lost over a million dollars. And wow. coming back coming back to friend that for the first time in my life, Jason. I looked at if I am going to do this um, and I'm going to, this is what I want to do. And now fully committed to the long game with one, one core thing. It was, I'm going to move from competency, which is I'm good at it. Proficiency. I want to get great at it, but I had to move to, I need to be brilliant at it. And that was really shifting and focusing on becoming masterful at a critical few things. And when I, what, when I've learned with all the research I've done around my book is when when a top performer hits mastery, 
what is their next path is they delegate to somebody on their team and now they take that next up level. So they're leveling up within the business. And I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I think that's that should be the goal for somebody if you're playing the long game is you get to a point where things are delegated. You're not delegating and sitting on an island. You're, you're delegating and you're focusing on the business from 30,000 feet. You want a full overview. You want a, a handle on everything. And that way, you know, you're, you're, you've achieved what most people desire in acquisition entrepreneurship is to buy the business, um, unless you can buy one with somebody already in place, which is fantastic if you can do that. But most people will buy it. You've got to, you've got to wear all the hats, learn how the business, and that's one thing Anita taught me too in the beginning. I was, you know, I, ne I, had, I hadn't done billing, I think in my first maybe eight or nine months, roughly. And I, we had a, a change and I ended up doing billing and I'm so glad that I did because we were able to create a new um, region within our own uh, regional documents. We were able to create a billing tracking sheet. Um, I kind of copied it from our, our London region from Anita, but that was important for me to learn how to do that because I you're not able to really delegate the task unless you understand it fully and you've gone through the process because I think it's, it's important for, for people to go through um, that that journey but know what you um, have to manage yeah. right you, exactly you, yeah you, you learn it but you just touched on yeah. something else, which is really under under appreciated in franchising you just said i borrowed it from the london franchisee yeah. so the, the ability to share knowledge the collective brain trust uh, that is a good franchise system uh, folks, when you're considering franchise ownership, you want to look at how well does the franchise or foster that interconnectivity and what is the culture of sharing and bubbling up best practices? Because that's uh, when when done right, it is one of the greatest assets of a franchise family. You cannot choose your biological family, but you can choose your business family. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah, it's very important. I And I've said this before, I, if it wasn't for Anita, uh, Jonathan Draycott, Adam Yashevsky, who I spoke about earlier, I, 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 I probably maybe wouldn't have even got into to JDI or commercial cleaning. So I really liked what they were doing. I really trust them not outside of business, just as, as people. I think they're amazing uh, individuals. And so that helps too. You know, you get to meet these people, you build the trust. And so jumping in and all the re other regional franchise owners, all the local franchise partners, you, you're exactly right. It's you, you want to be able to show up and be happy for, for your, uh, I, I call them your teammates, I guess. So I think that's, that's an important aspect of franchising. If I, if I have an issue, I can pick up the phone. I can call our Kitchener region. I can call London. And that's, uh, something that's pretty rare. I mean, when you're starting your own business, if you're a founder of a company, maybe Google ChatGPT, maybe you have some founder friends, but I think that's a big differentiator in franchising. We cannot agree more. Uh, the In business for yourself, but not by yourself has been said many, many times. Yep. As we wind down today, Jason, what would you ask you that I haven't asked you? about your journey or about advice that you pearls of wisdom for our listeners? Oh man, advice. I'm probably a bad, I would say sometimes I could be a bad person to give advice. I I've done, I've tried, but this could also be good. I've tried so many different things over the course of the years that I won't even touch on because some of the ideas are crazy, but I think it is important to go through different processes and systems, but I said it earlier and I'll say it now, the advice I would give is to look and at yourself, if you're looking to buy a franchise or start a business, it'd be look at yourself honestly and say, what are my strengths? What am I really good at? And what am I absolutely terrible at? And, and be honest with yourself about those as you're going through the business journey. If you're not, you could be suffering from a, the case of the uh, over be, being overly optimistic, which is, is, is a good trait, but it's, it, it also can get you in a little bit of trouble. So I'd say, you know, be honest with yourself, look at your, your skill set and apply that to the industry. And, you know, if the risk is, is there's risk present in any situation. I think if you can mitigate that risk, really outweigh the pros and cons, 
if the upside is greater than the downside, then I think you should you should move forward and and take the leap because you know how many people do we meet at these trade shows that go through and say you know I'm looking at this I'm looking at that and they never do anything they don't do anything with it there's too many options um, and they end up just you know staying staying sticking around with what they're doing I think that if I'm gonna say something about myself one thing I've done throughout my 20s and if you ask my fiance Taylor she shakes her head every time I do something because it always takes a it's always a riskier thing for somebody in their twenties to go in and just kind of burn the boats and, and put all your money into this venture that is a complete 180 from what you've did, what you've done before. But the risk is always going to be there, find a way to mitigate it. And if, uh, like I said, if it's, if the pros outweigh the cons, then, then move forward with conviction. Yeah, it, it's it's never when I when I hear you say that like burning the 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 the, the boats or uh, or the bridges is is getting in to something 180 degree is often more risky than getting into something that might be a 50 or a 70 degree turn but with leveraging the skills with a different support system that's where franchising comes in uh, you know it's not. Um, I like food, therefore I'm going to open up a restaurant. Running a restaurant is entirely different. I like golf, then I'm going to open up a golf store. Well, you don't want to turn your passion for what your hobby is into your business. You want to turn your passion for work and focus that on the core drivers that it takes to run the business. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm i not a proponent of, and this I don't want people to take this wrong way, but I don't always think that you should completely chase your passions. I think that if you find passion for something that maybe there's not an opportunity in some, for me, I don't think that's a good option. And that's just me. That's, that's my opinion. I think that you should find passion. Like you said, find passion in the work and, and the process of building, because that's what business is at the end of the day, you're building something to a greater height than it is today. So the passion has to be in the work. It has to be in waking up every morning and ending the day on a, on a, one one level above where you were when you started the day. So that's that's where you find your your passion in the progress and the challenges. Well, those are tremendous words of wisdom to finish on, Jason. I'd like to thank you for your your time today and for sharing uh, your experience and knowledge. Uh, so uh, we'd love to hear your progress as as you continue on in your growth journey. Well, folks, that's a wrap for this episode of Franchise Canada Chats. Uh, we look forward to having you join us in future episodes. Stay Thanks, well. Thanks, Gary.